Hello everyone and welcome to EduSurge Clinics. This is the last video in our series on phase one of the natural history of inflammatory bowel disease. And we are going to discuss the pathology slide-based inflammatory bowel disease mimics. If you have missed the previous videos, this is what we are talking about. There are four phases of inflammatory bowel disease. Phase one is the detection and diagnosis of disease. We are seeing this slide routinely in all our talks. We have discussed clinical features based differential imaging and endoscopy. We have discussed the basics of pathology in the previous talk. So in this talk, we are going to discuss the IBD mimics. We have already seen UC versus CD, reparative change versus dysplasia, DALM versus adenoma and ulcerative colitis with Crohn's like features in the previous video. So when we talk of inflammatory bowel disease mimics, we have to understand that these are the conditions that can confuse us with a relapse or a flare of the inflammatory bowel disease when it is not actually present. The first condition that we are going to discuss are some iatrogenic issues. The first being diversion colitis. What is diversion colitis? Once we have done a stoma at some point, the defunction part of the bowel has lost to access to essential fatty acids as well as there is stasis of contents in that area and diversion colitis is basically histological changes of defunctioning as a physiological response to stasis and loss of essential fatty acids. Okay, The features can be acute and chronic inflammation. There can be architectural distortion and transmural inflammation. So when we have transmural inflammation, the mimic is Crohn's disease. There can be fissures, lymphoid hyperplasia and poorly formed granulomas. We have seen some granulomas in the previous video. So all these features with transmural inflammation and granulomas, this can mimic Crohn's disease. What is critical is to take proper clinical history and then do an examination of the samples prior to starting treatment or prior to fecal stream diversion. What that means is suppose you have biopsies of the colon before the stoma was created, then we can histologically examine the rectum and colon prior to fecal stream diversion and this can help in ruling out diversion colitis. Second is pouchitis. We know pouches are created for total proctocolectomy surgeries after IBD. If there is primary chronic relapsing inflammation of the pouch, that is pouchitis, it can be acute or chronic. However, if the pouchitis is unresponsive, it can mimic Crohn's disease. Microscopically, there will be acute or chronic inflammation, atrophic villi and elongation of crypts. In very rare cases, pouchitis can have transmural inflammation and granulomas. So when there are granulomas present, we need to rule out the type of granuloma and then exclude Crohn's disease. So sometimes there can actually be Crohn's disease manifesting as pouchitis. This is seen in 2-7% to of patients. So always important in IBD mimics, the iatrogenic section, to look at the slides that were taken before starting treatment or before surgery. Third is drug-induced colitis. Patient can be on NSAIDs, which can lead to mucosal damage, occasional granulomas and IBD-like changes. Differentiating features, as always, clinical history of drug intake is most important. There will be increased intraepithelial lymphocytes and epithelial cell apoptosis. And there will be regression of symptoms and microscopic features on cessation of drug, which gives the diagnosis. When anti-neoplastic drugs are a cause, such as 5-fluorouracil, it can result in epithelial necrosis in the acute phase of colitis. And it can result in crypt regeneration and distortion in the resolving phase. And this can mimic ulcerative colitis. Okay, So it can have acute phase as well as chronic phase. The acute phase can be like any other acute severe colitis. Whereas the resolving or the chronic phase will mimic ulcerative colitis. For other IBD mimics, two important causes of microscopic colitis. Okay, There are two types of microscopic colitis. And both of them are IBD 
mimics. So to the left of your screen is lymphocytic colitis, which is a type of microscopic colitis with intraepithelial lymphocytes, 25 or more per 100 epithelial cells. So what is the normal range? Normal range is 6 or less per 100 epithelial cells. When you have intraepithelial lymphocytes, 25 or more per 100 epithelial cells, that is known as lymphocytic colitis. It results in mucin depletion and decreased cell height, which is indicative of surface epithelial damage. Okay, Usually, the crypt architecture is preserved in lymphocytic colitis. So, it is intraepithelial lymphocytes leading to surface epithelial damage. In lamina propria, there will be increase in lymphocytes, plasma cells, eosinophils and mast cells which are usually clustered at the crypt basis. On the other hand, collagenous colitis is a sub-epithelial collection of thickened collagenous bands, which are greater than 10 micrometers. Normal is less than 7 micrometers. The collagenous layer may extend from irregular basement membrane border to lamina propria. So usually the collagenous layer forms a regular basement membrane border but here it may extend into the lamina propria with an irregular basement membrane border. Okay, 2 to 5 percent of these cases can have aberrant crypt histology and there can be preserved mucosal architecture. Okay, so this is what differentiates collagenous colitis from all other colitis that it is a sub epithelial disease and there is absence of mucosal architectural distortion and atrophy. So, this is what differentiates microscopic colitis from inflammatory bowel disease. Now, coming to our usual differential diagnosis that we have been studying so far across so many videos. First and foremost, ischemic colitis. The differentiating features are ischemic colitis can in acute phase have superficial epithelial damage. And lamina propria will show hemocytin laden macrophages and fibrosis. There is usual absence of chronic inflammation unless the disease is chronic where you can have transmural involvement and strictures without inflammation. Okay, so that is what differentiates ischemic colitis from Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Basset syndrome we have already seen it can have aphthous ulcers, sometimes granulomas. But the differentiating feature is absence of transmural inflammation, lymphocytic aggregates, and presence of perivascular inflammation. Okay, So it is also known as necrotizing vasculitis. So perivascular inflammation is a characteristic feature of Bassett's syndrome. Coming to radiation colitis, again, there can be architectural distortion and cryptotrophy. Chronic inflammation can also be present. However, radiation colitis main feature is obliterative arteritis and a history of radiation exposure. Okay, so basically the arteritis causes hyalinization of the vessel wall and vascular ectasia, and this is what increases submucosal and intramural fibrosis. Okay, so this feature is not seen in IBD, and that is the differentiating feature. The other important point is history of radiation exposure. Coming to infective colitis versus ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, you can see that neutrophils in lamina propria are seen only in infective colitis. So if you have extensive neutrophils in lamina propria, this is usually present in infective colitis, whereas it is not present in ulcerative colitis. If you want a classical feature of Crohn's disease, the granulomas are classically present in Crohn's disease, whereas it is not present in ulcerative colitis or infective colitis. Both infection and Crohn's disease have focal change, whereas ulcerative colitis has diffuse change. Okay, So if you remember these points with classical history imaging findings as we have seen, endoscopy findings and then the biopsy, you can see that if you understand all these four pillars for all these differential diagnoses, you can achieve a diagnosis in most of your cases. Coming to granulomatous infective colitis, the most common being tuberculosis, it has florid coalescent granulomatous inflammation with extensive caseous necrosis 
and in 50% of cases, acid fast bacilli can be identified. So, TB has granulomas with caseous necrosis, acid fast bacilli in 50% of cases. Here, C-neosis, there are granulomas present but with central necrosis and there is no transmural inflammation. Other diseases with granulomas include cystosomiasis, deep mycosis and larval infestation. In immunocompromised patients, the common causes are cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex virus and cryptosporidiosis. So that also should be kept in mind when your patient is immunocompromised. So these are some of the common mimics, infective colitis, ischemic colitis, iatrogenic conditions like diversion colitis and uh, drug-induced colitis, radiation colitis, Bessette's disease. So these are all the conditions that are known as IBD mimics. There are some rare mimics, but we will not go into details of them. But just to complete the list, solitary rectal ulcer syndrome, has crypt hyperplasia and elongation in compared to crypt atrophy that is seen in IBD. So, SRUS has crypt hyperplasia and crypt elongation. There are scant inflammatory cells. So, that is again a differentiating feature. And fibromuscular replacement of lamina propria. So, this is how you can differentiate SRUS from IBD. Lymphoma has its own characteristic features and IHC. Eosinophilic colitis has a specific diagnostic panel and criteria that you need to follow to diagnose eosinophilic colitis. Chronic granulomatous disease, graft versus host disease, common variable immunodeficiency, and some subserosal or intramural masses such as endometriosis, diverticular disease, and malignancy. So with that, we come to an end towards an extensive discussion on this slide, clinical features and differentials, laboratory findings and imaging and differentials, endoscopy and differentials, pathology with understanding of microscopic features of key findings of inflammatory bowel disease, followed by inflammatory bowel disease mimics as differential diagnosis. So with that, we come to end of our discussion of phase one, that is the detection or diagnosis of disease based on all these criteria. In the next discussions, we will go towards phase two. We will see how disease is classified. Somewhere in between phase one and two is there's classification and severity assessment. So we will see that and then go towards phase two. Thank you.